there's that catchy tune. It can only mean one thing. It is time for, oh, not to play the tune again. Got to click, click the right button. It is time for yet another uh, fall publishing webinar. Hi there, everybody. I'm uh, Chris Bates, editor of Grower Talks, Green Profit, and the e-newsletter Acres Online. And I want to uh, welcome you to uh, today's topic, which is building better rotation programs for troublesome diseases and I'm going to be your host or so for the next hour as we tackle that topic. So I'm going to stop my screen share uh, and we're going to let uh, you Emma lead the way. Go ahead and share your screen all and right. uh, I'm going to mute myself and let you take it away and tell us all about how to build a better rotation program for those troublesome diseases. All right well here we go let's get into it. So you may not believe it, but diseases are actually pretty rare. So we put a lot of effort into protecting plants from pathogens and insect pests, but really disease is the exception, not the rule. And most plants leave the greenhouse healthy and pathogen free. But many of you know that when diseases do occur, it can sometimes feel like they blow up out of nowhere and suddenly they're a very big deal. Sometimes it feels like we're fighting a losing battle a little bit. No disease talk is complete without mention of the disease triangle. So all the stars have to align for disease to occur. And by stars, we mean that you need a susceptible host, a virulent pathogen, and a conducive environment. So disease develops over time. Sometimes you miss those warning signs, and by the time you notice you have a problem, it's already too late. Remember that most diseases rarely take out an entire crop disease tends to pop up in hot spots or localized area. So the same symptoms, if the same symptoms show up on every single plant or they show up across plant species, or maybe they show up all of a sudden, as in overnight you see symptoms, you need to start considering abiotic or other causes, not necessarily a disease. If there's a, if there's a defined pattern to that symptomology, um, it's probably not a disease. So there are some of the key times in production when you should be making preventative fungicide applications or at least thinking about them. And so these are the times when plants are most stressed and most susceptible. So young tender plant tissue during propagation, at transplant or anytime you're stepping up new plants into larger pots and then prior to shipping. These are also the times when plants are being moved and handled. So not only are the chances of injury and damage higher, but these are also great times to spread pathogens around. So we're going to look at the big picture and ways that we can be more intentional instead of reactive when we talk about disease management. IPM, or Integrated Pest Management, steers our decision making about pest management as a dynamic system we constantly adjust to meet our changing needs. The best programs use a variety of approaches to keep plants healthy and pest free. We can tackle any pest system from weeds to diseases to insects with the five basic approaches, cultural, monitoring, biological, chemical, and genetic. Cultural practices include sanitation, managing weeds that may harbor insects or pathogens, and managing environmental factors like light, water, and fertilization to maintain optimal plant growth. Make it a regular practice to scout your plants for early signs of insect pests and disease symptoms. Use a combination of biological and chemical control options when possible. You also need to think about plant genetics. Right plant, right place is a concept that centers around selecting plants or even more specifically genetics that are well suited for the environment you tend to grow them in. This can sometimes be difficult to achieve when market popularity drives plant selection. Superior selections produced in northern breeding climates don't always translate when we put these things down south. Along those same lines, pathogen and pest pressure changes depending on environmental conditions. So you may face different challenges depending on where you are growing. Disease resistance is not always the first priority when selecting plant cultivars, and to be honest, there is limited information publicly available to help guide your selections. Use resistant cultivars when possible. Today, we are going to focus on chemical control and sanitation. 
So there are a few factors that you want to consider before you pick up a jug off the shelf and go spray your plants. So fungicide selection begins and ends with a diagnosis. You need to pick the right fungicide with activity on the pathogen that you're targeting. As we'll see in a few minutes, this can be easier said than done. Next, we factor in application timing. Are we preventative or are we curative? Depending on the, certain, on the situation, certain products may have better curative activity. Depending on the disease that we're talking about, there may be no such thing as curative. And so in those situations, that's when you need to recognize it's time to bust out the trash bags and maybe cut your losses. Finally, we build out our rotations and you want to pay close attention to your frat groups or your mode of action rather than just picking based on trade names. In terms of resistance management, we need to consider contact fungicides as well as tank mixes for robust fungicide programs. When we talk about fungicides and classes of fungicides, systemic mobility does not mean the same thing as mode of action. So mobility or systemicity refers to fungicide uptake and distribution in the plant. Mode of action, on the other hand, describes how the active ingredient in the fungicide actually affects that fungal pathogen. So when we think about fungicide selections, we want to pay close attention to how the fungicide moves within the plant because it helps us figure out, one, where to position each product in rotation and also how we should be applying them. So should we be spraying them or making drench applications? So contact fungicides typically provide fast action on disease infections. They're intended to cover the plant tissue and to the extent that they cover the plant, they'll provide protection until they wash away photo decompose or metabolize. So most contact fungicides have shorter protection windows than um, when compared to penetrant fungicides. And this is why we like to put them out either in the beginning when our pest pressure is low or in the middle of a rotation. You also need to make sure you're treating the area that you want to protect. So if you're targeting leaf spots, you wanna make a foliar application. If you're targeting root diseases, you want to drench to protect the root zone. Spray coverage is everything when we talk about contact fungicides. Penetrant fungicides are so-called mm -hmm. systemic fungicides. All penetrate the epidermal layer of plant tissue. So some move upward, those are known as acropital penetrants, and some are translaminar and they move across plant tissue. So translaminar penetrants are also referred to as localized penetrants meaning they move into the plant tissue, but they do not move up and down within the vascular tissue. So if a pathogen has initiated an infection within the plant, then a penetrant fungicide has the ability to stop the infection. And that's what we call kickback or curative activity. Locally systemic products can also protect areas that may have been missed in the initial spray. So for example, the underside of leaves isn't usually reached by your fungicide application. So protectant or contact fungicides can't do that and spray coverage can make or break an application. An important note to remember though, is that efficacy is not dependent on mobility. So the specific type of systemic activity does not necessarily make one fungicide better than another. So most penetrants can last longer because they're inside that plant tissue, they're not degrading as readily, but just because the fungicide can penetrate doesn't necessarily mean it's more effective. And when applied correctly, some of those um, old faithfuls in your contacts can be really hard to beat in terms of efficacy. So you have to factor all of these in and usually you're gonna use an approach that combines fungicides from multiple mobility schemes. So it's important to understand fungicide mode of action when you're designing your programs. So there are a ton of fungicide options out there and it can get really confusing figuring out which products to use and when you need to use them. I don't want you to get lost in all the biochemical weeds here, but knowing the basics can help you make some strategic choices when you talk about designing your own programs. So some of our older contact fungicides have multi-site activity, meaning they attack that fungus in multiple locations. 
And as a result, they have a much lower risk for resistance development. Many of the newer fungicides have single site modes of action, meaning they have activity on one specific target site in a fungus. And sometimes they can be fairly specific to a, a group of fungi um, or particular species. So single site fungicides are at higher risk for resistance development because all it takes is a single mutation in the pathogen to overcome that fungicide. So in this simple example, a mutation prevented that active ingredient from binding to the target site. Remember that resistance development happens over time, usually as the result of repeat exposure, so overusing certain chemistries. Managing fungicide resistance is important so that we can extend the longevity of these products and make sure um, they're effective in the marketplace for a long time. So in effort to minimize the risk of resistance, you always want to follow the recommended full label rates and application intervals. You also want to rotate or tank mix with different modes of action. Luckily, we already have a system in place to take the guesswork out of figuring out which products rotate with other products. So fungicides are grouped by their biochemical mode of action. And these groups are commonly referred to as frat groups. And so if you want to see the complete table, you can point your phone's camera at that QR code um, to hit the page now. There's also an app that you can use. I haven't used the app myself, but I just saw that they also offer an app. So that may be a handy tool to have on your phone. So these frat codes dis distinguish the fungicide groups according to their cross resistance behavior. And that frat code is the main thing you want to look for when you're building your rotation. So here's a chart with all the biochemical target sites and active ingredients. There's a ton here. Um, and so let's zoom in on a couple in more detail. Here are the group three or the DMI fungicides. So you can see there are a bunch of them. Not all of these are available in the greenhouse and nursery market, but several are. And they all have slightly different strengths, along with slightly different plant safety profiles. Um, let's just pull one of these out. So this is methantrigluconazole. This is the active ingredient in um, BASF's new fungicide called Avelio. So DMIs are one of the groups that are at a higher risk for resistance development. Cross resistance is also present between DMI fungicides. So you don't want to rotate one DMI with another DMI. So basically what we recommend is you pick your favorite one, the one that works for you, the one that's safest for your plants, and roll with that DMI. On the other side of things, here are examples of multi-site fungicides. So most of these are contact fungicides, and they have much lower risk for resistance development. These are great utility products and they can be used throughout the production season and they help boost our fungicide rotation. So you can find those chemical groups on the fungicide labels. Usually the codes are on the front page of the label. Um, here I've highlighted, I've circled the codes on these two labels. Um, you can usually find them either at the top or somewhere in the middle of that label. And you wanna pay attention to these codes. So in addition to accurate record keeping, a good tip is to actually organize your chemical cabinets by frat codes. And this will help you make um, selections a little bit easier because you know that if you have two fungicides on the same shelf next to each other, you don't want to pick up those two fungicides and put them in a tank mix together. It's probably not going to be um, the most effective way. And so that'll be really helpful if you stay organized. It just makes things a little easier in terms of record keeping um, and making decisions later on. Let me ask you a quick question. Can you back up two more to the M to the M page? Sure. <laughs> one, one more right there. So so does M mean multi-site activity? So anything you see with an M, the M10, M06? M yeah, M11, so, um, all means so that code does correspond with multi-site activity, and then they're grouped based on, you know, just chemical groups. Um, and so M5, M6, it doesn't mean that there's five sites that that fungus is active on. It's just a, another number, a labeling scheme. Okay. And so, yeah, the frac table organizes all of them by numbers and groups, and then you have 
you know, some of the biopesticides, they're in a, a special group number as well. Um, I think they either have like a B or a P as their designation. And so it just helps group them together. Yeah, I, was, I wondered if there was any other little sort of tricks of reading the FRAC code to know what it is without having mm -hmm. the chart at your disposal. Yeah. Okay. So um, another thing to remember is that you want to rotate your mode of action, not your trade name. And so here's just an example. Um, these are all examples of either FRAC Group 7, which are the SCHIs, or FRAC Group 11, which are more commonly referred to as the QOIs or strobulurins. And then we have combo products that um, have two, both of these active ingredients in them. In them. So premixes have both modes of action and then your solo options. None of these products would make good back-to-back -back rotation partners because they all contain one or the other active ingredient. Premixes and combos are nice because in some cases they can offer built-in resistance management. So the manufacturer has gone ahead and taken the guesswork out and made it a little bit easier. So we can achieve these, the same thing when you use tank mixes. You just need to be sure you're, you perform a compatibility jar test anytime you're trying a new tank mixture. Um, you also want to make sure you, you know, watch out for any label warnings in terms of which products you can mix with other products. There are many benefits of mixtures. First, you get improved disease control because you broaden the spectrum of activity. So you may pick up more pathogens with a tank mix, um, or you might be combining a systemic active uh, with a contact to maximize protection. Resistance can develop rapidly, and oftentimes you don't even know when you have resistance brewing. So mixtures give uh, a little bit of security to your disease control, especially when you have resistance that's already, resistance that's already present and you just don't know about it yet. So we have a range of products. So we, we have broad spectrum multi-site chemicals to more targeted or specialist products. So those multi-site contacts, like I said, they have activity on many fungi in different classes. So they make good rotation options or tank mix partners with translaminar and locally systemic products. Pageant intrinsic and orchestra intrinsic, those are two of um, two examples of those premix combos that contain uh, two modes of action, so QOI and a SDHI. These combos make good foundational products because they're broad spectrum with those two modes of action. You also have some of those older standbys, so things like thiophanate methyl or even something like flutioxanil. And these are nice utility options because they can be tank mixed and added to programs when you need a little bit of extra protection. At the right side of the spectrum is where we have our specialist products. And so here are things like Orvego, Segovis, even something like Subdue Max. And these are all examples of Oomycete-specific products, and they control diseases caused by Phytophthora and downy mildew pathogens. Another specialist product is Secree. It has activity on Botrytis and pretty much nothing else. So those specialists have a very narrow disease spectrum, so they won't help for other diseases that may pop up. So humid conditions that favor downy mildew outbreaks can also favor other leaf spot diseases and botrytis. And that's why it's important to rotate your specialist with your broad spectrum products, so things like orchestra or a contact like mancozeb or chlorophalanil, because you want to ensure you're protected against anything that may pop up. So don't focus on one disease only to allow another disease to run rampant. So you want to think about the bigger picture, um, so not only is fungicide resistance or fungicide ro rotation important for resistance management, you also cover all your bases. So let's talk about timing. Um, you want to be proactive instead of reactive when it comes to plant protection. So make your preventative fungicide applications before disease occurs. Don't wait until you see symptoms because by then it might be too late. Kimberly, I think you're muted. Thank you, Emma. Sorry about <laughs> Sorry. that. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt your part. Um, preventative applications are always better, but sometimes early stages of disease can easily be overlooked. 
When selecting curative products, go for systemic options or locally systemic products to protect new growth as it emerges. These plants were treated with orchestra intrinsic brand fungicide. The plant on the left was treated preventatively and is clean. On the right, with the curative app, the new growth is infection free, but the disease lesions are still visible on the older growth. Curative applications are less forgiving because you have to stay on a strict fungicide schedule. If you miss an application, the pathogen can sometimes resume growth and start sporulating again. Remember, there's lots of inoculum on any fallen leaves, and that's another reason why you want to keep produ production free of debris. This will help to limit inoculum and reduce the potential for new infections. Here's another example of how some diseases can cause very severe damage. If you miss the preventative window, the damage will persist all season long. This is Bloomiorella leaf spot on cherry trees, which causes a shot hole symptom. Unfortunately, you cannot reverse the damage if you miss the treatment window in the spring, which is why timing is critical for all preventative applications. So you can reach a point where plants will not recover and no amount of fungicide is gonna save you. And so this is particularly true for some of the root and crown diseases like Pythium and Phytophthora, but also things like Botrytis blight that has made its way down into the crown. And so again, that's where sanitation comes into play. So these are great examples of what I like to call false hope. So these poinsettias here on the left, they have Pythium root rot. So early on, this disease can be easily overlooked. It'll start out as minor stunting or plants that will wilt during the hottest part of the day. And so you may see some recovery at night once the temperatures cool back down. As the disease progresses, you eventually end up at the point of no return and you get permanent wilting. And this could take days or it could take weeks. Meanwhile, that pathogen has produced tons of spores and so in the, in, in the case of Pythium, you have oospores, which are the survival spores. You also have sporangia and swimming zoospores. And so all those spores likely resulted in new infections and a buildup of inoculum in your production system. The plan on the right is a great example of why treating upon arrival and at transplant is so important. So that original plug was probably infected as evident by those rotted roots around the plug. And then fungicides were applied at transplant and the plant was able to push out new healthy roots. Unfortunately, as soon as those fungicide applications wear off, the pathogen that's lying in wait there um, can become active again on that decaying, on those dead and decaying roots. And so most fungicides do not have activity on those thick walled survival spores. And so if the plugs looked rotted when you got them in, it's probably a better bet to just, you know, keep them isolated or trash them depending on how severe the symptoms are. And that's also the importance of regular scouting. You know, walk your crop, crop <laughs> take a close look, pull some plugs or pull some roots, um, and actually look at that root system. It's a good habit if you walk your crop during different times of the day. So if you always scout in the morning, you may miss the early signs of stress that are more pronounced as the greenhouse heats up. So you wanna know what a healthy crop looks like so that you can easily spot when something is slightly out of place or not quite right. So we're gonna spend the rest of the time um, highlighting some of the rotation options for some of the more common diseases that we encounter in greenhouse and nursery production. So we'll start off talking about leaf spot. So for most of these diseases, they are caused by pathogens that produce splash dispersed or sticky spores. And so this is why we tend to see a lot of foliar leaf spot diseases in outdoor nursery production, where we have overhead irrigation and frequent rainfall. There are many leaf spot diseases. Some are caused by primary pathogens, whereas others are more opportunistic and can come on on some of that older or damaged foliage. We tend to see a lot more leaf spot diseases on holdover plants. So some of those stragglers that you guys either don't sell or decide to keep for another season. 
And most of the time, these diseases do not kill the plant outright, but leaf spots can reduce marketability um, and they can make the plant unsaleable. And if left unchecked, some leaf spots can be fairly severe and cause defoliation. So leaf spots, including anthracnose diseases, can be hard to identify. We tend to lump them together for that reason. Um, and the good news is that many of the leaf spot pathogens can be managed in similar ways. And so it always, it isn't always super critical that you know exactly which leaf spot you have in order to develop an effective management program. As you'll see later though, that is not always the case for all diseases. So just some examples, you know, common names can be a little confusing. Um, here we have anthracnose on Diffenbachia. You can also have anthracnose diseases on many other hosts and the symptoms vary depending on what host they're on. Um, here's one on ornamental grasses. And so sometimes they can be quite striking. You know, some people might think this is a nice variegated cultivar when in reality it's a leaf spot disease. Um, this is Cercospora leaf spot on hydrangea. So all of these diseases tend to blow up in the summer, especially after tropical storm events. So you need to stick to a strict preventative fungicide program, stay on top of these diseases. You wanna protect the plants before any major storm events, especially in outdoor production, um, and realize that your fungicide applications may not last as long in areas that have frequent heavy rain events. Um, Cercospora can look different depending on the host, same with all the other leaf spots. Here we have it on pansy, so you notice the symptoms are a little bit different. And then again, here's an example on nandina. So everything looks a little bit different depending on which host you, you have it on. For most leaf spot diseases, sanitation is particularly important. Any infected fallen leaves can serve as a source of inoculum. So that's why you wanna make sure all those areas in between your plants are free of any fallen leaves and debris, sweep them up, blow them off, um, do whatever you need to do to stay clean. You also wanna consider plant spacing. So this will go a long ways to minimize humidity, but will also minimize the potential for pathogen spread between, between plants. So remember I said that most of these pathogens produce those flash dispersed spores. So the closer you have a neighbor plant, the easier it is for those spores to splash over and cause new infections on um, nearby plants. So when we talk about leaf spots, um, the strength of a product is in a good rotation. So you wanna start your rotation with broad spectrum foundational products. You can rotate into a DMI like a Velio, or you can come back with another combo, something like palladium, and that'll give you, you know, additional modes of action in fewer applications. Always include contacts like chlorothalonil and mancozeb. These are great for fast knockdown and for resistance management. They're also nice, um, a great way to put out a protective spray right before a major rain event because some of those contacts, especially products like Dacanil, um, they're weather stick and they've got good rain fast. So they're really nice protection against some of this, you know, inclement weather. You can also add a plant safe adjuvant to improve your efficacy, um, especially for some of the more difficult to control diseases like anthracnose. Always check your labels um, with plant safe adjuvants, make sure they're safe on the crop that you wanna use them on and test them before you try any new mixes. You wanna consider plant safety when we talk about fungicide selection. So this is poinsettias. So we, um, we all know there are limited options of fungicides that can be used after color change on poinsettias. So many products leave behind unacceptable residue or they can cause discoloration or spots on those brack. So diseases like powdery mildew, botrytis, and even things like alternary leaf spot can pop up later on in the season. And so these diseases can reduce marketability. They can also cause considerable damage. So you want options for preventative applications to ensure that your plants are healthy when they're shipped out the door. So in this particular example, um, this is Avelio, the new fungicide, and we made applications on prestige red poinsettias. So we applied the highest label rate and did not observe any residue or injury. So we're excited that Avelio is gonna be one of those plant safe options 
um, for poinsettia producers. For other fungicides that may have residue issues, you can use plant-safe adjuvants again um, to reduce those residues. So like I said, always read the label instructions for tank mix compatibility mm -hmm. and plant tolerance and any watch out. So botrytis, this is kind of everyone's um, worst case scenario. Um, you know, everyone has probably run into botrytis somewhere along the way. It's one of the most destructive and economically important diseases of greenhouse crops. It can also be problematic in outdoor nursery crops and even in the landscape during cool, cloudy, and damp conditions. Most of you have dealt with this disease before. It's challenging to control because the pathogen can feed on living tissue, but it can also act as a saprophyte and feed on dead tissue. Botrytis usually occurs on young tender tissue, so buds, some of those spent flowers, um, and then damaged tissue is definitely most susceptible. This is the classic sign of botrytis. You can see that fluffy gray sporulation. And so sometimes you might have to look for it because it, it gets down in the canopy. Um, and it, you know, anytime you have dense canopies, it's, that's usually where botrytis is hiding. Here it is looking a little closer. And then um, you can see those tufts of spores. So this fungus grows rapidly and produces thousands of spores. And these are mostly spread through wind and water, um, but can easily be spread throughout uh, the greenhouse as well. And once the pathogen has made its way into the crown, there's very little you can do in terms of control. So managing botrytis requires a multi-prong approach that includes cultural practices like sanitation and humidity management, along with those chemical controls. So reduce relative humidity and limit overhead watering. Increase your plant spa spacing to um, promote drying out. Fall and winter botrytis outbreaks are common. And so make sure plants are protected, especially when you have overcast, chilly, wet weather that's being forecasted. When we think about fungicide options, this pathogen has a sordid history of resistance. And so there's resistance to several of the fungicide classes. And so for botrytis, tang mixtures and rotations really are your friends. And so this is probably the most difficult disease to control with fungicides. And once you let your guard down, um, you most likely won't be able to catch back up. So don't stretch those spray intervals and always make sure you're using the highest label rates during favorable conditions. We like to recommend combo products like Orchestra rotated with another combo product like Palladium because that gives you four modes of action and only two applications. Then you can come back with your contact fungicides or even tank mix them in throughout the production season to boost your control. For products like Decree or even Chipco or Iperdione, resistance has been observed. So only use these products in tank mixtures and rotate with other modes of action. Don't use back-to-back -back or sequential applications of the same mode of action for any of these fungicides because like I said, resistance development um, can happen pretty quickly in Botrytis. Some of that is because you have to, you know, apply so much fungicides, but then also it produces so many spores that your opportunity for muta mutations to arise are much higher than for some of the other fungal pathogens. And so rotation is key, um, is everything pretty much for botrytis control. Emma, can I pop in with a quick question? Yes. Because uh, I think it fits here. Dusty wants to know if, if uh, in products that have two active ingredients like orchestra, pageant, palladian, I think you mentioned, um, is the percentage of active ingredient uh, generally lower in average than the single product with, this, with, with that active ingredient? So usually it just depends depending, um, you know, on the formulation. When they make tank mixes, you can sometimes have synergistic effects. So you get the same level of activity at a slightly lower percentage than would be in a solo product. But usually when manufacturers create those formulations, they're not, they're using ratios that still correspond to label rates of the solo. And so you never want to use things that have sub-lethal rates of any of the ingredients. 
And so um, that's the benefit of those premixes is because usually the manufacturers have kind of figured out what ratio is needed. And then they have a rate range scale that kind of, you have a higher rate for higher disease pressure, a lower rate for lower disease pressure. Everything balances out and actually usually does relate back to a solo active ingredient in terms of number of active ingredient pounds on the ground type of deal. So, okay. um, but yeah, it can be tricky sometimes. And that's the thing about tank mixtures. If you're using a tank mixture, you don't want to cut the rates um, because you don't know for sure if you're going to suddenly end up with a sublethal rate. And so if you're making your own mixture, always stick to label rates. Don't go lower. Don't half rates, things like that. So either pick those premixes or do tank mixes at label rates. So that was a great Excellent. question. Excellent. Thanks, Emma. All right. So Kimberly, you want to take that over? Absolutely. Um, finally, let's bring it back around to IPM and sanitation. So start clean to stay clean. I know this is easier said than done. Starting with a clean production area can go a long ways in staying clean throughout the entire production season. Two unsung heroes of successful IPM programs are sanitation and record keeping. Everyone knows their value and putting them into consistent practice is a game changer for keeping pest pressure down. During the busy seasons, it can be hard to do the proper cleanup and sanitizing between crops as you are operating under tight timelines and short turnaround times. If you aren't able to do a full clean out and sanitation, at least be sure to clean up any debris like fallen leaves, petals, or spilled media. Clean up messes like these immediately. This is the perfect environment for botrytis to run rampant. Clean up fallen petals and leaves to reduce inoculum and pathogen spread. All right, so foliar diseases, botrytis. Now let's talk about root diseases. So when it comes to root rot, a proper diagnosis can mean the difference between excellent disease control and total failure. And that's because some of these diseases require those specialist products that we talked about earlier. It's almost impossible to effectively diagnose these diseases by visual symptoms alone. Rotted roots look like rotted roots and you usually don't know what caused the rotting. And so the first step is black root rot. So um, the pathogen here has changed names a few times. Um, the new name is Berkeleomyces vesicola. So taxonomists love to confuse everybody and change the names every few years. Um, and so you'll probably still hear it referred to as Salaviopsis because it's really hard <laughs> to change what you've been calling something for, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, but we'll keep it easy and just refer to this disease as black root rot. So this can be problematic on bedding plants like pansy, viola, calibrachoas. It's also quite common on woody plants like Japanese holly, in particular, sky pencil holly. Um, and the pathogen can be introduced on infected plant materials, so plugs or liners. We've also seen it come in on tissue culture cuttings, which really speaks to how difficult it can be to manage if you've got something on tissue culture. Sanitation and preventative fungicide applications are key to managing this disease. The above ground symptoms are subtle and can easily be mistaken for other root diseases or for nutritional issues. So as disease progresses, the root system eventually rots out. So these caliber crows are showing early indications of black root rot. That foliar yellowing is also associated with high pH and that's conducive for this disease. The pathogen can be significantly suppressed if you use a lower substrate pH, so lower than 5.5. The downside is that not many plants are going to tolerate a low pH like that, so it's not always the most practical um, means of management. The pathogen produces thick-walled, dark structures. These are called alluriospores or chlamydospores. Um, these spores are what give the disease its name of black root rot because they're dark. So in early stage of disease, you'll see those black root tips because the roots are full of the dark spores. And these spores can survive a long time, so several years in organic debris around the greenhouse. So as you can imagine, reusing dirty pots, flats, and trays is a big no-no. 
For woody production outdoors, the pathogen can become established in the soil, and so it can hang around for years, and control is very difficult. Here's just what those spores look like under a microscope. So as far as chemical control goes, not many fungicides even have the labiopsis on the label. Some that do can be fairly inconsistent in terms of control. The industry standard here is thiophanate methyl. In this trial, we looked at Avelio, which is the ASF's new fungicide, either applied solo on a 28-day interval or in a rotation with orchestra intrinsic brand fungicide. You can see that the Avelio treatment and the rotation with orchestra both offered excellent control of black root rot. Avelio applied on a 28-day interval performed better than the industry standard of thiophanate methyl that was applied on a 14-day interval. And so it also shows great activity at much lower use rates. So the, the rate here for Avelio is three ounces, whereas T-methyl, you had to go out at 15 ounces. The difference is definitely clear when you look at the root. So those Avelio-treated plants on the right, they have nice, healthy, white, robust root system. The plant treated with thiophanate methyl had sparse roots. And so we're really excited that Avelio is going to provide another reliable option to manage this disease because options are limited. You can use Avelio as your foundational product, and then you have the option to tank mix something like um, Empress intrinsic brand fungicide if you're treating small plants and transplants. And that gives you broad spectrum disease protection, not only from Salabiopsis, but also for pathogens um, like Cylindrocladium, Fusarium, and Rhizoxonia. Some of your rotation options still include using thiophanate methyl. You can also come back with something like Medallion. Medallion is great because um, it really is excellent for Rhizoxonia diseases. And usually on bedding plants, um, you can have a number of root rots that come into play and can be problematic. So you wanna make sure you're drenching with products that can protect against a range of pathogens. Phytophthora. So let's round it out talking about the worst ones. <laughs> um, so there are several species of Phytophthora that can be problematic in production. It causes root and crown rots, damping off symptoms, and it can even cause foliar blight. Some of the common hosts include Gerbera daisies, pansies, vincas, and then woody hosts like azaleas, rhododendrons, and boxwoods. Most plants are susceptible, for, uh, susceptible to Phytophthora. And these pathogens have a complex life cycle with many spore types, and they can all germinate and infect plants. And so here are some of the typical symptoms that you would see on young plant trays. And then on older, more mature crops, symptoms can be misleading. So is this plant too hot? Does it need water? So whenever you see random wilted plants, you wanna make sure you pull the, the plant out of the pot and check the root. And this is what you might find if you have Phytophthora. So that plant there on the right has nice, white, healthy roots. The one on the left there has brown, rotted roots. And this is really classic for what Phytophthora would look like. You have options for Phytophthora. You want to start your rotations with a strong Phytophthora specialist. So something like Orvego. Orvego has two modes of action that have um, direct activity on zoospores, which are the spreading spore. You can include um, something like Empress to protect against other root diseases, and then rotate through other OMIC-specific products as needed. Finish your program with another strong product like Segovis, um, and so this ensures that you ship out your plants with some residual protection. So not only is it going to protect them on the market shelves, but also if, you, um, if those plants immediately get planted into the landscape. Products like Adorn or Subdue Max should be tank mixed with other products to reduce the risk of resistance development. And I'll highlight that here in a second. So we can't talk about Phytophthora without at least mentioning its cousin. So Pythium is tricky. You can find Pythium just about anywhere. It's very common in greenhouses and nurseries. It often comes in as a secondary colonizer, so we tend to see it a lot in conjunction with other diseases. Some species cause minor injury, some species cause major damage. And so Pythium aphanidromatum can cause devastating losses um, and cause damage just as well as Phytophthora or you know, another cousin like downy mildew. 
So I personally have a special love-hate uh, relationship with Pythium since I spent seven years working with it um, in grad school. And so I would just say that, you know, be careful not to underestimate Pythium. It can definitely be the gift uh, that keeps on giving. So poinsettia season is in full swing right now, and Pythium root rot may be lurking on your plants. So, you know, keep that in the back of your head. Like with Phytophthora, stunted or wilting plants are usually the telltale signs of Pythium root rot. Early on, you may notice a few rotted roots. Eventually, the entire root system can rot out. More commonly, it looks like the picture on the right, no roots, <laughs> because Pythium attacked early on and killed off new roots right after transplanting. Remember earlier when I talked about scouting? You want to walk your houses in the middle of the day to easily spot diseased plants. So any root rot, they're going to look more stressed in the heat of the sun. Um, and so that's how you can pick out your wilted plants. These plants are dead. You just don't know it yet. So whenever you see really severe wilting symptoms along with rotted roots, you should probably just trash those plants to limit pathogen spread. Another example here, um, so if you have algae everywhere, you probably have a moisture or a water problem. Pythium and Phytophthora produce swimming spores, and standing water creates the perfect opportunity for pathogen spread. So waterlogged or saturated substrates also cause anaerobic conditions, and that favors Pythium because it can act as a saprophyte on those dead, decaying roots. Pythium can also contaminate irrigation water, so you want to be careful um, especially if you're using recirculating water systems. So fungicides that work on Phytophthora may not work on Pythium. Um, your options for Pythium are much more limited. The key to Pythium control, especially on susceptible crops like garden mums or poinsettias, is to hit them with the heavy hitters early in production. Make sure you're drenching at transplant. So products that have consistently performed well in efficacy trials include Segway, Terrazol, Subdumax, and even Benzai. So resistance to mefenoxum is widespread, and most facilities usually have mixed Pythium populations, so they have sensitive and resistant strains. With so few active ingredients available against Pythium, it's really hard, though, to just throw away an active. So we need to think about resistance management strategies here. Methanoxum can still be used effectively as a tank mix partner, but you have to be smart with how you're using it. If you have a history of methanoxum resistance at your facility, you do not want to make solo apps of subdue, and you don't want to start your program with it. Also, don't skimp on rates. Sublethal rates can drive resistance, so always make sure you're using label rates and go out with the highest recommend rate under high disease pressure. And so that's kind of, you know, the basics of some of these most common diseases. Here's an example of how we can tie this all back together. So these are boxwoods in production and symptoms included severe leaf spot and overall poor vigor. The grower was worried he may have had boxwood blight and sent samples for official diagnosis. The results came back as Phytophthora, root rod, and the leaf spot was anthracnose and not boxwood blight. This is a good example of how having robust rotations can protect you against a range of diseases. You should include foliar applications in your rotation and also use drenches to protect the root and crown. Make drench applications to the plug stage or whenever plants are transplanted into larger pots. These times are usually when root and crown diseases can be problematic. In this example, the grower drenched with Orvego fungicide to clean up the Phytophthora root rot. He also used foliar applications of Orchestra Intrinsic brand fungicide rotated with Mancozeb to clean up the anthracnose and protect new growth. And finally, I want to bring it all back to sanitation. We really can't stress this enough. Realize when it's time to cut your losses and take out the trash. Don't hold on to diseased plants. Get rid of them early on. You know, don't waste your time and your money trying to save a lost cause because they only serve as a source of inoculum and they're probably going to die later anyways. Um, so cut your losses early. So protecting plants during the growing season, it's easier when you have a plan in place to prevent disease before you even see symptoms. 
So here are some of those targeted and broad spectrum rotation options for those most common diseases. Each of these programs starts with broad spectrum foundational fungicides. These products do the heavy lifting, heavy lifting and act as the backbone in your rotation program. You can plug in your specialist products as needed for disease prone cultivars, and then you round it out with multi-site contacts for resistance management. You can run, run these programs in the order they're listed. You can use them as a menu of options, or you can mix and match to cover your bases across multiple diseases. So these are research-based, they've been grower tested, but it's up to you. So we make these suggestions and you make the ultimate decisions of what will work at your facility. And then finally, um, just if you want to learn more, this is our new fungicide, Avelio. You can point your phone at that QR code and hit the page now. We're really excited about this product um, and we hope you guys try it out. If you want any more information about any of the topics we covered today or anything about the ASF product or solutions, don't hesitate to reach out to your local technical specialist or your local sales rep. Um, here's our contact information. I think we may have a few minutes um, if there's any questions, but we just wanted to thank everyone for being here today. And like I mentioned, you know, don't hesitate if you've got any questions, um, reach out, text us, call us. We're always available. So with that, uh, I'll hand it back to Absolutely, we've got time for questions. I'm going to leave uh, <laughs> the lady's contact information up there. You may want to uh, do a screenshot of it though, so you don't lose it, everybody, because you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna need that. We got some great questions. The first question that came in though from Mindy. Mindy, don't leave if you're still here. I want to I'm gonna save yours for last because it's a really interesting question. Uh, but let's get into some of these. There's a mixed bag here. Roberto wants to know what is your experience with uh, colitotrichum on flocks. So colitotrichum. Um, colitotrichum is, yeah, that's so in it. That's an anthracnose disease. Um, and so, you know, for anthracnose, you definitely want to be using your rotation approach. Start with those combo products, something like orchestra or pageant, rotate into your contacts. You can even tank mix a contact with pageant or orchestra, and that kind of gives it a little boost. I will mention that if you're having trouble getting control of colitotrichum or anthracnose diseases, you may want to consider adding a plant-based adjuvant to your tank mix. Um, so something like capsule is one that we've found um, works really well. Um, but any plant-based adjuvant you can use. And sometimes that, that will make a difference in terms of efficacy and it gives you a little bit of a boost. But when we talk about anthracnose, it produces a ton of spores. They're splash dispersed. Preventative applications really are critical there. Um, once you're in a more catch-up curative situation, it's going to be really hard to get it back on track. Um, so prune and protect. <laughs> New growth is kind of the best recommendation. All right. Uh, Caesar's asking, and I think you asked it, answered it in the the last slide you show. Wanted to know how many chemicals would you recommend per a rotation? And each of those recipes you showed had three rotations. Is that right. pretty standard? So it really just depends on how long your crop cycle is. Um, so for most of these products, a two-week rotation is sufficient. And so you would continue that rotation for the duration of your, um, your program. So I had three examples. You could start back over with the first one again and continue the rotation as needed. For certain diseases like botrytis, you may need a shorter interval. You may be in that more seven to 10 day window um, just because pressure can be very severe. But for most fungicides, if you're using good fungicides, you can get 14 days out of them. And so, um, you know, just always kind of figure out your disease pressure. If you've had a lot of rain or anything like that, your intervals may be a little shorter but you would just continue your rotation throughout. Um, we tend to recommend at least three modes of action uh, for you know, best resistance management, but it really just depends on how many apps you can get out before you ship the plants out the door. Sometimes you don't have time for a ton of application. Okay, that kind of ties into Dusty's second question here. If you have a severe disease issue and the product you're using says to do a follow-up in 14 days, should you wait and do that follow-up in 14 days or can you rotate something else in at seven days? 
say, for a, for a, a, a more powerful treatment? So you can rotate, um, you know, you might not have to go back every seven days. If the product you're using has a 14 day interval and you didn't have a lot of rain in between, you should be able to expect, you know, that that would probably last about 14 days. Um, you don't necessarily have to come back with the exact same product in 14 days. Like you said, you can come back in with another product that has efficacy, strong efficacy on that same disease. Okay. So it really just depends. It also depends what rate you were using. If you were using the lower end of the label rate, it's not going to last as long sometimes as if you're using the higher end of the label rate. So just be careful um, with that as well. All right. Ryan, Ryan has a two-part question here. What uh, active ingredient uh, would you recommend to control uh, fusarium diseases? And are okay. they best managed with an early drench or a late-stage foliar spray? So fusarium is one of the most difficult diseases to control in terms of soil-borne diseases, um, especially in outdoor production. So if you're growing garden mums, for example, and you have them on landscape cloth or something over top of native soil, um, that fusarium can be ubiquitous in the, in the native soil areas. And so that's sometimes how it comes into play. So it can be very difficult to control. And with fusarium, preventative applications really are the way to go. You're not going to clean it up. You're not going to cure it. So if you miss it in the beginning, it's probably not going to work out well. Um, so in terms of fusarium, most of the fungicides that are efficacious on fusarium do need to be applied as a drench. So foliar applications aren't going to do much if you're talking about fusarium um, root and crown rot. Okay. And so recommendations... Because he mentioned what, a couple specific species. Uh, he mentions uh, graminarium and verticaloides. Does that does the does the species of fusarium matter? Yeah. So the well, most of the root and crown or fusarium wilt type species are oxysperum, and then there's some other ones that can cause more foliar type diseases. So it really just depends, you know, what you're targeting. If it's a foliar disease, or um, you know, uh, if it's if it's root and crown, treat a drench. If it's foliar, use a foliar um, foliar app. In terms of actual modes of action or recommendations, those combo products are really great. You also have the options of things like, um, you know, TerraGuard, Medallion. Um, some of the DMIs have really good fusarium activity. So you do have some options, but just know that um, preventative applications really are key for a fusarium. Uh, and you will uh, want to use multiple modes of action for sure. Uh, Arisha says, I'm not sure if it's Phytophthora or Pythium. And I use two products going after these two diseases. Is that a good practice? So you want to make sure that if, you know, oftentimes you don't know whether you have Pythium or Phytophthora. And so because you have more options for Phytophthora that she said to do Pythium. You want to make sure if you're only using two products that one of them at least has Pythium activity. So something like Segway, Etradiazole, Subdue, unless you have resistance, um, even Finstop has Pythium activity. So you only have a few options that have really strong Pythium activity, whereas you have more options for Phytophthora. So I would just recommend, you know, check the labels and make sure you at least include one that's got good pythium activity as well. All right. Marion wants to know, because you are recommending some good stuff here, what do you recommend for pseudomonas? Pseudomonas. So um, bacterial diseases are difficult. Obviously, we have, you know, copper-based products that have been used historically. Um, some of the new biological type products can be effective in some cases. So something like yeast, um, or triathlon. Um, so you have a few options, but usually it's a rotation with copper-based products and then some of the more biological um, biological products have been right. performing well. And uh, now to Mindy's question, and Mindy's still on. Mindy, asked, Mindy money. <laughs> yes, it is, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Mindy Money wants to know, what if you were spraying an amazing rotation and you still have problems? So, I mean, that can happen. Um, sometimes, usually when 
you're on a good spray program, you're spraying strong chemistries and you're still having breakthrough, sometimes that's because you miss those critical preventative windows and you're playing catch up. So whenever you're playing catch up, you're never really ahead of it. And so you may see breakthrough, you may see symptoms. And some of these diseases, once the damage is done, you can't reverse those lesions. You can't get rid of those lesions. They don't disappear. Um, and so that can be part of the problem. But, you know, inevitably, sometimes disease is hard to control. And even though we're using the best products, it can get a away from us. It can get out of hand. And so I would just say in those cases, you know, look, take a look at your timings, take a look at your spray program, what you're using, and maybe you're not using, um, you know, the strongest product in the beginning, and so you get a little behind, and then you come back in later with some stronger products, but, you know, focus your heavy hitters up front, follow it up with some of the ones, you know, for resistance management and things like that, but always start strong and end strong if possible. And watch your sanitation, Mindy. Yep, sanitation. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, oh, another question came in, a product r r question uh, from Sierra uh, for Cladosporium. What would you Cladosporium. Recommend? Cladosporium. So um, that's another kind of, you know, general, it's probably not on a ton of labels. Some of these more, um, you know, random, foliar diseases, foliar pathogens, they aren't always on every label. So I would say use products that have a range of leaf spots on the label, use a good rotation approach. So use those, you know, combo products, rotate with your contact options. Things like chlorothalonil and mangazeb have activity on almost everything when used, you know, at the right timings. And so don't forget about those. If you have something that you can't find anything labeled for it, um, you know, some of these products probably have activity whether or not they're actually listed on the label. So just stick with those strong rotation options and usually you, you'll be okay. Okay. And uh, Marion suggests that um, if, if your rotation program isn't working, check your environmental conditions. Maybe, uh, yep. maybe, maybe that's not so good. And last comment is from William who says, no questions. Thank you for an outstanding informative diseases program thank you for william for uh, for tuning in all right uh, i am going to uh share my screen one last time just to remind everybody that uh, if you want to in fact if you probably need to go back check some of those slides some of the details that emma and kimberly gave uh as soon as we sign off i'm gonna work on getting it uh uploaded to our archive page which is growertalks.com slash webinars under the uh, view it now section, I think is what it's called. Uh, same place you, you sign up for it. And, um, and while you're there, check out the, uh, the other webinar I've got coming up uh, near the end of the month, which is on environmental controls. So that's everything from, uh, from me. You guys were awesome. Tremendous, great information. Thanks so much for sharing. We need to do it again, because I have a feeling you just simply uh, touched on the tip of the iceberg when it comes to these, uh, these, these horrible diseases. And then maybe we'll do one on the good diseases, the ones we like having around. <laughs> All right, Kimberly and Emma, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate it. On behalf of Thank Emma, you. Kimberly, everybody uh, at BASF, and on behalf of my stellar ball publishing staff right out there somewhere who's working hard so I don't have to, I'm Chris Beatty saying so long, everybody. See you next time. See ya. Bye. Thank you.